I am the Philosophical Bachelor and today I'm going to talk about of God or nature and man. This is a summary of the ethics by Spinoza. If Spinoza's treatise, The Ethics, had predated the scriptures of the major world religions, I wonder how we would view God and religious life today. Would deism rank alongside the major faiths in its number of adherents? I think that readers of The Ethics, if they paid it serious attention and took the time to study it, may be surprised by how radical and yet how reasonable Spinoza's ideas and conclusions are. Yet he was expelled from his community for his views, even though where he lived, the Netherlands in the 17th century, was considered among the most liberal countries in the world. Hence it would be worth examining his life briefly before plunging into his canonical work since understanding who Spinoza is and the context of his times can help us understand why his ideas were controversial then and even today. Spinoza was born in 1632 in Amsterdam, the capital of the Netherlands. His Jewish parents had, before his birth, fled religious persecution in Portugal. Amsterdam was a comparatively tolerant society compared to elsewhere in Europe where Jews were persecuted by Christian authorities. Jews were not granted full citizenship in the Netherlands but were allowed to run businesses and practice their religious beliefs openly, though the community was expected to regulate itself and not interfere with the Christian majority. His family ran a merchant business importing agricultural products from Portugal. He attended a Jewish school, leaving school at 17 to help run the family business. At age 23, he was expelled from the Jewish community. Though it is not entirely clear why, he did have unorthodox religious views as you will discover as this video proceeds. That, however, is not in itself grounds for expulsion given the broad-mindedness of the community and how its leaders were businessmen rather than rabbis. Nonetheless, given the fragile and tentative acceptance of the Jewish community in the Netherlands, if any individual Jew criticized the Dutch political or religious establishment or questioned the way the Jewish community regulated itself, he puts the entire community at risk, according to Beth Lord, who wrote a helpful study guide of the ethics. His expulsion deprived him of political, economic and religious status. He was banished, had to move away, settling in Rinsburg and sustaining himself financially by lands making while continuing his philosophical work. As a result of inhaling fine glass filaments while grinding the lens, he had lung cancer which led to an early death at the age of 45. During his lifetime, he only published two works one on Descartes' philosophy in his own name, and the other was Tractatus Theologico Politicus, or Theological Political Treatise. The Tractatus was published anonymously, though it became widely known that it was written by Spinoza. It was met with controversy, banned in the Netherlands, and established Spinoza as a radical thinker. He was accused of atheism, sacrilege, and denial of the immortality of the soul and was attacked by all sides of the religious and philosophical spectrum, such that to be called a Spinozist became a term of derision and for being anti-establishment. For this reason, his other works could not be published in his lifetime, including his most famous, The Ethics, which were published by his followers after his death, though drafts had been circulated to friends and followers. The ethics uses the geometric method, which involves first setting out definitions and axioms before using them to form propositions. Spinoza did not invent this method. The reason why it is called the geometric method is because it follows the deductive method used by Euclid around 300 BC in his book The Elements to create the mathematical system of geometry. The idea is to build up a logical structure based on true foundations using deduction. Because such a structure of propositions is ultimately derivable from true definitions and axioms, theories formulated according to such a method will hence have to be true. In such a system, definition and axioms are what have to be accepted to be true. Definitions are based on the meanings of words and their combinations. 
Axioms are what are set out without proof, usually considered so fundamental that they cannot be proved, themselves being what proofs are then built on. Usually, axioms are commonly accepted intuitions or are self-evident. After these building blocks of definitions and axioms have been established, propositions based on them can then be put forward. The initial propositions build logically from the definitions and axioms, so if the definitions and axioms are accepted as true, the propositions which are based logically upon them must also be true. These propositions then become part of the structure, whereby further propositions can be put forward by building upon definitions, axioms and foregoing propositions. In this way, the entire theory is built in an irrefutable way, analogous to the way a house is built. First, the foundations are constructed, after which the structure is built on top of it. Spinoza's The Ethics has five parts, each of which builds on the previous part. Part 1. Of God Part 2. Of the nature and origin of the mind Part 3. Of the origin and nature of the effects Part 4. Of human bondage or the power of the effects Part 5. Of the power of the intellect or on human freedom The book should be read in this order since later propositions build on earlier ones. Every brick needs to be in place to finally have a solid and complete structure. However, I am going to present his idea not in the geometric way, which is hard going, and probably one reason why people trying to understand Spinoza's ethics will come to this essay. While his geometric style of argumentation may be rigorous and useful for scholars, it can be difficult for his readers to follow since the propositions are interrupted by his proofs and commentaries. Even if we read the propositions alone, their flow can be rather disjointed. Instead, I am going to present a summary of his book in a more flowing style. It will not be as tight, but it will read more naturally and be more digestible. Enough prologue. Let's begin at the very beginning, a very good place to start. Part 1. Of God While Spinoza may be best known for his metaphysics today, we have to remember that his aim in the ethics is to lay out an ethical system of how we should live, as individuals and as a society. But before he can talk about ethics, he needs to address the nature of the beings that ethics apply to, that is, human beings. Before he can talk about human beings, he needs to talk about the nature of all of reality, which is why he begins with God. The idea is to understand the nature of reality and from their understanding figure out the nature of human beings. From understanding both these foregoing concepts, he can then talk about how we should live. I hope you can already see the logic of his schema and recognize the scope of his ambition. Some of my listeners may recoil just from the mention of God, but central to Spinoza's metaphysics is the idea of God. However, his conception of God is rather radical, and unlike the Judeo-Christian God. Deus Siva Natura, God or Nature, sums up Spinoza's identity of God with nature or all of existence. God is nature. Nature is all that exists, which means that God is all that exists. Everything that exists is literally in God. Today, the debate is still raging on whether Spinoza is a pantheist, a deist, or even an atheist. What is clear is that he definitely is not a theist, a person who believes in a transcendent God that is above and beyond nature. His views do align with the reductive, pantheistic idea that God is identical with everything that exists, that God and nature are one and the same thing. Spinoza will hold that there is nothing supernatural. Nature is all that exists and there is no being outside of nature and no power that is not already contained in whatever power nature has. Yet, if pantheism is a type of theism, then Spinoza is not a pantheist. Spinoza does not believe that worshipful awe or religious reverence is an appropriate attitude to take before God or nature. There is nothing holy or sacred about nature, and it is certainly not the object of a religious experience, according to Stephen Nadler's entry on Spinoza in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Spinoza has been accused of being an atheist as well, as someone who does not believe in God. However, 
What some of his accusers mean is that he does not subscribe to the prevailing religions of his time, be it Judaism or Christianity. Nadler also suggests that reductive pantheism and atheism have rather similar ontologies, that all there is, is nature, hence establishing a link between atheism and Spinoza's beliefs. However, Spinoza is not an atheist, since the concept of God is central to his system, as you shall see. In addition, he also has denied being an atheist. I think the best way to think about Spinoza's theological belief is to consider him a deist. A deist, spelled with a D, is someone who believes in the existence of God, but based only on reason and not on revelation or religious authority. Yet even this labour does not fit perfectly since he does not talk about God as a creator. The process in Spinoza's metaphysics is more like a spontaneous emanation from the infinite nature of God, the way the Neoplatonists thought about it, than an actual act of divine creation. In part 1 of God, from the foundation of 8 definitions and 7 axioms, Spinoza gives us 36 propositions. His metaphysics is what results from an analysis of concepts, which he uses to reason on the nature of reality. It is quite important to understand what his views are about the nature of God in part 1 since they are the basis for the later parts. However, it is also the most difficult chapter in the book since his ideas about God are rather different from how most people understand God from the teachings of the major religions. There is also a chicken and egg problem for the reader. Spinoza needs to lay out some basic ideas before he can begin developing them which makes the demands on his reader's patience greatest in part 1. To properly understand Spinoza's view on God, it is probably best to set aside your own beliefs or ideas and try to understand his so that you can follow his line of thought. You will encounter ideas and conclusions that challenge how you understand things and may even seem plain wrong, but to benefit from Spinoza, it is probably best to just try to follow where he leads and try to understand his reasoning. In order to proceed, put your objections aside, try to first understand what he is doing, and then perhaps consider your objections after you get the entire picture. So let us set our understanding of God aside and try to follow Spinoza's process. Everything in existence are effects that must have been caused by causes prior to them. To understand an effect, we must try to understand its cause. This cause would have a prior cause. If we keep tracing this chain of cause and effect all the way back, we will arrive at a first cause. This first cause must already be there since if it was caused by something else, we can go yet further back until we get really to the very first cause. So the first cause is something that must have caused itself. A defining characteristic of something that causes itself is that it must exist. The property of existence must be in its essence, that is, such a thing must necessarily exist. Spinoza calls such a thing substance, which is something that is in itself and is conceived through itself. A thing that is in itself does not depend on anything else for its existence. It is self-sufficient in its existence and does not require anything else to bring it into existence. A substance has attributes, that is, it has qualities or properties. Attributes are what constitute the essence of an object. Having laid the above out in a series of definitions, he is now ready to define God. Perhaps a good way of understanding his definition of God is to take it as a question that Spinoza would try to answer. If there is such a thing as God, what must he necessarily be like? For Spinoza, if there is a God, he must necessarily exist and is an absolutely infinite being, a substance with infinite attributes, with each attribute expressing the infinite and eternal essence of God. To talk about infinity, he discusses finitude. An existent thing can be finite or infinite. If it is finite, it is limited by something else. My example is to consider a fish tank filled with water. The water in the tank is finite, 
its amount being limited by the walls and depth of the tank. An interesting point Spinoza makes here is that what can limit a thing must be of similar nature to it. The walls of the tank are similar to the water in that they are both material physical objects. Thoughts can limit thoughts, and bodies can limit other bodies, but thoughts cannot limit bodies, and bodies cannot limit thoughts, since thoughts are immaterial and of a different kind to bodies which are material. What is finite is limited by other things of a similar nature, while what is infinite has nothing limiting it. If there is a God, there will be nothing limiting God, which makes God infinite with an infinite number of attributes, each attribute expressing God's infinite nature. This idea of infinity, being without limits, brings us to the definition of freedom. What is free is what has nothing constraining it, nothing limiting it. God is free because nothing can constrain God. A thing that is not free is constrained by something else. What happens to it and what it does is necessitated by something else acting on it. A thing that is free is self-sufficient, existing solely from its own necessity. It determines its own actions. It does not act because other things command or influence it too. God is also eternal, without beginning and end. Since God is a self-caused substance, it is already existent and always has been. To even speak of beginnings and ends is to try to understand the idea of eternity from the point of view of a limited, finite and mortal being. To properly understand eternity, we have to adopt the point of view of what eternity entails for an eternal being. We naturally are unable to do so since we are not eternal beings, but perhaps we can simply appreciate that a self-caused being is a substance that has always been there and will necessarily always be there since existence is of its essence. So Spinoza has established that there exists the first thing and indeed the first thing is not merely first but has always been there. Even if we do not accept yet that there is a God, which he has yet to argue for since he has only given us a definition of what God must be like should he exist, we can accept his idea of substance as something that is self-caused and has attributes. It must be something which came prior to other things, and indeed other things come from it. Whatever other things are, they are modes of substance. Spinoza argues that there can only be one substance. To differentiate between two things, we look for differences in their attributes. If they have completely different attributes or properties, they are two unique things with nothing in common with each other. If they have nothing in common with each other, they could not have caused each other since the cause of something is related to its effect. If there is no difference at all between two things, they must be the same thing. So there cannot be two substances with the same nature or attributes. For something to be the effect of another which is its cause, they must share some attributes since what can affect another must be of the same kind. They must also have a causal link. Hence, it follows that one substance cannot produce another substance. It cannot be the cause of another substance because the substance, by definition, has unique attributes not found in any other substance. Therefore, a substance cannot be produced by something external to it. Since it cannot be produced by something else, for it to exist, it must be self-caused. From the definition of self-caused, the essence of a self-caused thing necessarily involves its existence. But that still does not mean that there can be only one substance, since there can be multiple things that are self-caused and are unique, and have always been there. Spinoza Nix argues that every substance is necessarily infinite. This is because, logically speaking, a substance is either finite or infinite. By logically, what is meant is that we have exhausted the list of possibilities, leaving no possibility unaccounted for. So a thing that exists is either finite or infinite, since what else could it possibly be? If it is finite, it means that it is limited by something of the same nature. Recall my fish tank example and how only things of the same nature can limit each other. 
But Spinoza had just established that there cannot be two substances of the same nature, which means there is nothing to limit the substance, making it infinite. This is a proof by elimination or exhaustion, where he proves that something cannot be one of two possibilities, hence leaving only the other possibility. His positive proof is that finitude is a negation, while being infinite is an absolute affirmation of existence. Since a substance must necessarily exist, that is, its existence is absolutely affirmed, it follows that it must necessarily also be infinite. Next, he proposes that the more reality or being each thing has, the more attributes belong to it. This proposition might seem perplexing, since we logically tend to think of something as real or not real. Hence, to speak of something being more real is odd. To understand what he means, we can take our cue from more being. The more being a thing has, the more qualities belong to it. Its essence is richer. This means that if a thing has infinite attributes, it would have the most being, the most reality, be the most real thing. What can this most real thing be? Conceptually, it would be God if he exists. God will consist of infinite attributes and each of these attributes expresses the eternal and infinite nature of his essence. So God, if he exists, is infinite and substance which we know must exist from Spinoza's arguments is infinite. Spinoza premises that there is only one substance and that substance is God. So God exists because God is substance. QED, quod irat demonstrandum, or so it has been shown. Since God has infinite attributes, the attributes of extension and thought belong to him also. Extension is a technical term meaning the space a thing occupies. Since God is infinite in extension, whatever exists must exist within God since where else could it go? There is nowhere else to go given that infinite extension covers all of space. Everything that exists can only come from substance and hence are modes of substance. All that exists are substance, modes of substance and there is nothing else left over. Since modes come from God's attributes, all things are part of God's divine nature. Since God's nature is infinite, it follows that there are infinitely many modes caused by God, meaning there should be infinitely many things. Our intellect can objectively only comprehend what is in nature. What is in nature are God, His attributes and the modes of His attributes, which means that the intellect can only comprehend God, His attributes and its modes. Nothing can exist without God and all things are in God. Since all things are in God, there is nothing outside of God, and hence there is nothing external to Him. Since there is nothing external, it follows that nothing outside God can compel God to act, affect or cause Him to act, making God the only free cause. Since God is eternal and infinite, His attributes are likewise eternal and infinite, and hence the mode that comes from these attributes are eternal and infinite. Because of the ineluctable relation of cause and effect, whatever happens, happens necessarily and all things are eternal and infinite. Yet existence is not a quality of the essence of these things, since for existence to be the essence of something, that thing needs to be self-caused. Hence, for anything to come into existence and remain existing, it has to be caused to be so by God. Individual things are modes of God's attributes expressed in a fixed and definite way and their essence are caused by God. How a thing acts is conditioned by God and it is powerless to decide how it wants to act. How this is operationalized is that things are conditioned to exist and act by causes external to them. These external causes are themselves conditioned by other causes in a chain of cause and effect that finally leads to the first cause which is God, leaving no room for contingency in the universe. Spinoza is a hard determinist. There is no free will if free will means having a choice in deciding our actions. 
Even God does not have choice since He is perfect and has always to choose the best way. He cannot choose any other way than the perfect way. God's power, by which He and all things are and act, is His essence itself, reasons Spinoza. Whatever is in God's power must necessarily exist and happen. From these flow all things through the chains of cause and effect. Here ends part 1, but Spinoza thought it necessary to add an appendix to combat a human prejudice of teleology of final purpose. Men commonly suppose that all natural things act on account of an end, he writes. People like to think that there is some final objective that everything is heading towards. Spinoza believes that nature has no final objective and that any final causes attributed to things are fictions invented by us. Instead, all things proceed by a certain eternal necessity of nature and with the greatest perfection. God does not act for some objective since if he did, it means he wants something that he lacks and God lacks nothing. Instead, everything proceeds down the chain of cause and effect and because of this ineluctable chain, what happens, happens necessarily, not for any grand objective but as a result of what has proceeded before. Spinoza also tackles the perennial problem of evil. Why are there bad things in nature? According to Spinoza, what is good and bad is a matter of human prejudice, whether they please or offend our senses or are useful or otherwise compatible with human nature. For Spinoza, what makes a thing perfect should be judged solely from their nature and power. He writes, God did not lack material to create all things, from the highest degree of perfection to the lowest, because the laws of his nature have been so ample that they sufficed for producing all things which can be conceived by an infinite intellect. Part 2 Of the Nature and Origin of the Mind Having established the nature of God, Spinoza proceeds in part 2 to discuss the nature of the human mind and body, building on what we now know about the nature of God. Recall that God has attributes. From these attributes come modes or things. The human body is one of these modes of God's attribute of extension, while the human mind is a mode of God's attribute of thinking. Ideas are concepts formed in the mind and these can be true, adequate or inadequate. These concepts are true when they correspond with their objects. They are inadequate when they have the properties of a true idea but can be considered on their own without their objects. They are inadequate when they do not have all or any of the properties of a true idea. One of God's attributes is thinking. Thinking involves ideas. God has ideas of his own essence and of the modes that result from his essence. Ideas that we have are caused by God in his attribute of thinking and not by the objects themselves. Recall that modes of each attribute of God manifests only that attribute. For example, the body is a mode of God's attribute of extension, while the mind is a mode of God's attribute of thinking. Spinoza established in part 1 that for things to affect one another, they need to be of the same kind and if they are caused by different attributes, they cannot affect one another. How do the mind and body then communicate and affect one another? They do not, according to Spinoza. However, they do coordinate. Spinoza's commentators term this coordination parallelism. The order and connection of ideas is the same as the order and connection of things, because for God, his power of thought is equal to his power of action. God's thought about things are in sync with what the things do because his thought and actions are both manifestations of his various attributes. What he thinks is what takes place materially. Thought and action are both aspects of his unified being and his being is self-consistent. Since he is the cause of everything which takes place materially, what takes place materially does so according to his thought in the order and connection in his thought. 
The order and connection in his thought are then the order and connection of causes, which then causes the order and connection of material things. Applying these to human beings, the first idea the human being has is of its own body. The body is the object of this idea and the mind is the idea of the body. Hence, human beings are composed of both mind and body. The body is a mode of God's attribute of extension and the mind is a mode of God's attribute of thinking. The human body is a union of both modes. It is one unified individual. The human being is the mind when it is considered under the attribute of thought and it is the body when it is considered under the attribute of extension. Since everything is in God, the human mind is part of the infinite intellect of God, just as the human body is part of the infinite extension of God. Bodies can then either be in motion or are at rest. Which state they are in are determined by other bodies. A body can affect another and be affected by another. A more capable body is able to affect more things and be affected by more things. The mind, being the idea of the body, perceives what happens in its body when it is affected or is affecting. Thus, the more capable the body is, the more capable the mind is. The body is comprised of parts and the mind has ideas also of these parts. When our bodies are affected by external objects, the mind perceives those objects and its own. However, the ideas it has of those objects are really about how our bodies react to those objects rather than the objects themselves. The mind only knows about its body through the ideas of the modes by which the body is affected. The mind perceives the feelings the body experiences when its body encounters external bodies and their effects on the body's parts. The mind only knows itself through these ideas of the affections of the body. Thus, it does not have an adequate knowledge of its body parts, its own body, and external bodies. In this way, the mind has a confused idea of these affections. And since the mind is the idea of the body, the mind also does not have an adequate knowledge of itself. Instead, it has a confused and fragmentary knowledge of itself and as already mentioned, its body, the parts of its body, and of external objects. The mind also has an inadequate knowledge of how long our body can exist because the body is affected by other things, though God knows since he has ideas of everything and their interactions. We also have an inadequate knowledge of the duration of things for the same reason that they are affected by other things of which we do not have adequate knowledge about, making all things seem contingent to us, though not to God, for which all things that happen happen necessarily. All ideas to the extent that they are related to God are true, since all ideas God has will agree with their objects. Falsity is a privation of knowledge, it is a lack. Inadequate and confused ideas arise to the extent that they relate to a human mind. But like true ideas, false ideas also arise with necessity, given the ineluctable chain of cause and effects. Spinoza proposes that what are common to all things such as extension, motion, and rest are conceived adequately. These common properties do not constitute the essence of anything since what is essential is what is unique to the thing. In this way, the more a human being has in common with other things, the more adequate ideas his mind has. Ideas that follow from adequate ideas are also adequate ideas since there is a chain of deduction. Hence, those initial adequate ideas, which are ideas about what is common to all, serve as foundations of our reasoning. Spinoza distinguishes between three kinds of knowledge. The first and lowest kind is opinion or imagination. The second is reason, arising from common notions and adequate ideas. The third and highest is intuitive knowledge arising from adequate ideas of the essence of God's attributes, which leads us to adequate knowledge of the essence of things. The first kind is the cause of falsity, while the second and third are necessarily true and are what we use to distinguish between truth and falsehood. For Spinoza, not all knowledge comes from reasoning. 
The third and highest kind comes from intuition, meaning what is given to us, what we sense and understand to be true, despite no proof being furnished of it, since proof is of the nature of reason, which is the second kind of knowledge. The nature of our reason from its consideration of cause and effect will tell us that what exists and happens, exists and happens necessarily, while it is only through our imagination that we consider things to be contingent. Spinoza reasons that we have an adequate knowledge of God because God is the cause of everything. When we know an effect, we know also of its cause. Because God as cause is common to everything and what is common is known adequately, we know God adequately. Because of the ineluctable chain of cause and effect, there is no free will. Even what we wish for is caused by some prior cause. For Spinoza, the human will is a faculty of affirming or denying and not desire, with such affirmation and negation taking place only on ideas. Hence the will and the intellect are one and the same thing. Part 3. Of the origin and nature of the effects. Having explained the nature of the human body and mind, which Spinoza based on the nature of God, he now turns to our psychology specifically our emotions. He provides a rather detailed treatment in part 3 of how our emotions affect us so as to discuss how we can control it in part 4 and be free of our passions in part 5. Spinoza has dealt with adequate and inadequate causes in part 2. What makes a cause adequate or inadequate has to do with how well we understand it. An adequate cause is well understood with clearly and distinctly perceived effects why an inadequate or partial cause has effects that are not well understood. He makes a distinction between what it means to be active or passive. We are active where we are the adequate causes of our actions, when our actions follow from our nature and we understand rationally what we are doing. We are passive when instead of acting based on our nature and our reason, we are being acted on by external things and we are only the partial cause of our actions. Emotions are modes of our body. Emotions can increase or decrease our power to act. When we are active, that is, when we are the adequate cause of our emotions, Spinoza terms these emotions activity, while when we are passive, he terms such emotions passions. Passions are how we feel when we are being acted upon by external things, while activity is what we feel when we are acting from our own natures. Even after events have passed, we may retain the impressions or traces of objects we interacted with, which are the memories of those things. Within the essence of all things is the notion of self-preservation. Everything endeavours to persist in its own being, writes Spinoza. A thing cannot destroy itself, since its nature is to preserve itself. Hence, things can only be destroyed by external causes. Things are contrary to each other to the extent that they are able to destroy each other. The body and mind cannot direct each other since they are not of the same kind, the body being material and the mind immaterial. Yet they are in sync due to parallelism as already explained in part 2. Hence, what increases or decreases the power of activity in the body likewise increases or decreases the power of thought in the mind. Spinoza believes that all emotions reduce finally to three main ones, joy, sadness and desire. What moves the mind to a greater perfection is called joy by Spinoza and what moves it to lesser perfection is sadness. Since we want joy and to become more perfect, the mind thus tries to conceive things that increase the power of activity in the body. When it does conceive sad things that decrease the body's power, it tries to recall things contrary to those sad things in an attempt to override them. The mind shrinks from conceiving things that decreases the power of the body and consequently of the mind. From these two principles of A, trying to increase our joy so as to increase our power, and B, withdrawing from what decreases our joy which decreases our power, Spinoza goes on to examine the various ways of how we are affected by our emotions. If the mind is affected by two emotions simultaneously, subsequently when it is affected by one of the two, it feels the other also. 
Because of this association, anything can be linked to an emotion accidentally. My example is when one's child gets killed in a traffic accident by a Mazda. Henceforth, Mazdas are associated with his death, despite how most Mazda drivers do not get into car accidents with children. Your previously neutral feeling towards Mazdas is henceforth associated with the sad emotion of that accident. In this way, we also come to associate objects with emotions, in this case Mazda cars being the object and the emotion being the sadness from your child's death. One may feel a hatred or love towards an object despite the object not being the actual cause of the emotion. In this case, all Mazdas become objects hated by you because of your child incidentally being in a car accident with a Mazda. Even an object bearing similarities towards that Mazda, say a Honda, can cause love or hate to arise towards that Honda. Spinoza suggests that the propensity to associate things together can lead to prejudice. If one loves or hates a person of a different class or nation, he may extend that love or hate to the entire class or nation. What Spinoza here is only elucidating the phenomena of this association between emotions, he will later talk about using our reason to overcome our passions and control our emotions, meaning that such accidental associations not based on actual cause is irrational, should be avoided, and can be overcome by using our reason. For objects we hate, which resemble something we love, we can be conflicted, both hating and loving that object at the same time. Say you are a car lover, but because of the accident, you may now have developed conflicted feelings towards cars. We continue to be affected by the image of what we love or hate, even when the object is no longer in the present time. The image brings the absent object back into our consciousness, and it can feel just as painful as if it was actually present. Just the thought, the image of that Mazda car in our minds can bring back the sad feeling as if the accident just occurred, even after some time has passed. If we conceive that the objects of our love are destroyed, we feel pain, while if we conceive that they are preserved, we feel joy. If we conceive that things we hate are destroyed, we feel joy. If we conceive that our loved ones are affected with joy or sadness, we likewise feel joy or sadness in proportion to the intensity of their feelings. When we conceive that an object affects our loved ones with joy, we feel love towards that object. If an object affects our loved one with sadness, we feel hate towards it. We feel joy when things we hate are affected with sadness, while we feel pain when those things are affected with joy. We hate the person who gives what we hate joy, and love the person who gives what we hate sadness. We affirm what affects us and our loved ones with joy, and negate what affects us and our loved ones with sadness. Likewise, we deny to people we hate what gives them joy, and affirms what gives them sadness. However, the joy that comes from harm visited on those we hate comes with some pain for us. This is because of the empathy in human nature. For people whom we feel nothing towards, when we conceive of them being affected with an emotion, we imagine them to be us because of their resemblance to us as people, and hence we are also affected with that emotion. Since people we hate also resemble us, we are also somewhat pained by their suffering. Because of empathy, we have pity for people who are miserable because their misery affects us in a painful way. We are unable to hate them since that means that we would rejoice at their sadness which is contrary to pity. Instead, we want to free them from misery as far as we can because we want to bring about what we think is conducive to our happiness and remove what gives us sadness. Our empathy also comes into play when we try to do what we think makes other people happy and avoid doing what they are repulsed by. This is a form of imitation or mimesis since we imitate liking or hating what others like or hate. When we do something we think brings others joy and consider ourselves as the cause of that joy, we feel joyful and esteemed. When we do things that we think affect others painfully, we feel pain in the form of shame. Other people's emotion towards something affect our emotions towards that thing. If others love what we love, 
it makes us love the thing more. If others hate what we love, it causes us to doubt our own love. We also hate that person because that person is a cause of sadness for our beloved. Because we want to bring about what is conducive to our happiness, we want others to love what we love and hate what we hate. Imitation and mimesis can drive us to act compassionately and with empathy, but it can also give rise to envy and ambition. When we see someone enjoying something which we are unable to obtain, we may try to prevent him from having it, since we imagine his enjoyment as an obstacle to our joy. When we love someone, we want that person to love us back. If we think our beloved loves someone else more, we feel hate towards our beloved and jealousy towards that other person. However, the more we think our beloved loves us, the greater is our complacency towards their love. The more we feel an emotion, the more we want to feel that emotion. Once we begin to hate a loved object, once the love is gone, we hate it even more than if we had never loved it before. The more intense was the former love, the more intense will be the newfound hate. A person who hates another will want to do that person an injury unless he fears that he himself may suffer even worse injuries than was inflicted. When we love another, we want to benefit that person. If we confer that benefit but receive no gratitude, we feel pained. If we feel hated by another for no cause, we hate the other in return. If we are injured by another who hates us, we seek revenge. Hate begets hate and hatred is increased when reciprocated. However, when hate is met with love, love can destroy hate since a stronger contrary emotion can diffuse the other emotion. Just as the hate is more once the love is gone, hatred that is vanquished by love, which becomes love, becomes a greater love than if hatred had never preceded it. When there are multiple causes of an emotion, it decreases the emotion felt towards each cause, since the emotion is then divided over the multiple causes. When we think that the object causing the emotion acted out of free will, we feel greater emotion than if we think it acted out of necessity and so could not help itself. For instance, if we got hit intentionally by another person, we will feel greater anger than if we got hit accidentally by that person, or if the hit came from a fruit that fell from a tree. You may be wondering how this makes sense, since Spinoza does not believe in free will. He is referring to our perception of the situation, but precisely because there is no free will, to have a greater emotion may make no sense if we consider the situation reasonably. Whether we were hit by a person or by a fruit that fell from a tree, the hit happened necessarily, and so to have any greater emotional reaction is not warranted. Our emotional reactions vary. Different people are affected differently by the same object because everyone's essence and hence reaction is different. Even the same person may be affected differently by the same object at a different time. We are more attracted to unique objects than objects that are not unique or belong in a group. When we consider ourselves and our power, we feel joy and this joy is enhanced if we view ourselves as unique and also when we are praised by others. Our mind tries to think of only things that assert our power of activity since we feel pain when we contemplate our weakness. This pain is enhanced when we are blamed by others. While Spinoza asserts that there are three primary emotions, joy, sadness and desire, there are many secondary emotions that are composed of them. When the emotion is not caused by our nature, but by external objects, making them partial and inadequate ideas to our reason, these are passions since we are passive as we are being acted on by these external objects. However, joy and desire can also arise from adequate ideas, making us active, since we act out of our reason which is then in accordance with our nature. Sadness, however, decreases our power of activity. Part 4. Of Human Bondage or the powers of the effects. When we are unable to control our emotions, we are the partial or inadequate cause of these emotions. External forces are then the main cause of these emotions in us, 
which Spinoza terms passions because they make us passive. When we are passive, we are in bondage to the external forces which are driving us. He had earlier said that what is considered good and evil are modes of our thinking and not in the things themselves. Good is what we know to be useful to us, what evil or bad hinders us from attaining what is useful. Good is also what we think helps us become closer to our imagined model of human nature, what evil prevents us from being that model. Perfection is how close we come to becoming that model person. For Spinoza, virtue and power are the same. Virtue is the very essence of nature, of man, insofar as he has the power of bringing about certain things which can be understood through the laws of his nature alone, he writes. When we manage to act in accordance with our essence, it is a virtue since we are obeying our nature. Spinoza posits as an axiom that there is nothing in nature that does not have something more powerful and stronger than it which can destroy it. Things may prevent us from being able to act in accordance with our nature. Acting in accordance to our nature is a virtue. Hence, acting virtuously requires us to have the power to overcome external forces that prevents us from acting in accordance with our nature. Because there are always stronger forces in nature, our ability to preserve our own existence is surpassed by the power of external causes. The force of such external powers is strong because their effects cling to us. Since we are unable to opt out of being a part of nature, we are unable to remain unaffected by external forces. We are unable to act from our own nature alone, making us vulnerable to passions. While we have no choice but to follow the general order of nature, what we can do in order to be virtuous is to adapt accordingly to such an order. Our knowledge of good and evil translates to feelings of joy or sadness in us. Emotions caused by things in the present are stronger than emotions from absent things, such as things in the past or future. The closer in time things are to the present, the stronger is the emotion caused by these things. When the things causing the emotion are distant, the emotion is weaker, up to a limit where the period is so far away that the effect becomes equally indistinct. For instance, our emotions felt towards something that happened 1,000 years ago may be as indistinct as something that happened 10,000 years ago. Emotions felt towards the possible are stronger than emotions felt towards the contingent. Spinoza makes a distinction between the possible and the contingent. The possible is something which causes unknown, while the contingent is something which essence does not involve existence, meaning it may not exist at all. This makes emotions towards contingent things even weaker than emotions towards past things. The more concrete the image of the thing seems, the stronger is our emotion towards it. Emotions are not restrained by knowledge itself, but by the emotion that knowledge causes. Desires arising from emotion can overwhelm desires arising from knowledge. Emotions are rational when based on adequate knowledge and irrational when based on inadequate knowledge. Our rationality may be overtaken by irrational emotions, that is, our passions. This leads to two consequences. A. People can be more easily moved by opinion than reason since irrational emotions from mere opinions can overwhelm their reason. b. Desires that come from knowledge of future or contingent things can be easily overcome by desires for pleasures in the present. For instance, we know that to maintain our health into the future, we should avoid sugary foods, but the cake in front of us is too tempting and we give in to such a desire, even with the knowledge of the future harm the cake may bring. The above explains why people lack power and consistency, and sometimes are unable to obey their reason. We should be guided by reason in our actions. 
Self-preservation is the foundation of our virtue where we seek to preserve our beings. Happiness is our ability to preserve our beings. Hence our knowledge demands that we love ourselves, seeking our own advantage through seeking what is useful for ourselves and desiring what brings us closer to our own perfection. Spinoza acknowledges that there are people who destroy themselves through suicide, acting contrary to their nature which demands self-preservation. He believes it is because such people are irrational, calling them weak-minded and completely conquered by external causes contrary to their nature. To become more perfect is to develop our minds and intellects. Spinoza had in part 2 talked about how being able to feel more and having a greater ability to affect other things makes us more capable, which increases the power of activity of our bodies and hence the power of thought in our minds. In part 3, he talked about how joy does the same while sadness decreases our power. In this part, part 4, he talks about how we should seek out useful good things and avoid evil ones. When two things of the same nature are joined together, they become more powerful. For human beings, things of the same nature are other human beings. If we are all alone, we will have a poorer understanding of things than if we are with other people who can agree with one another and work together. In a community of like-minded people, we are able to achieve a richer knowledge and are better able to collectively preserve our individual beings. Hence, Spinoza concludes that living in society is good for us. To men, there is nothing more useful than men, he writes. Because we want what is useful for us to be maximally useful, we also will want for others what is good for everyone and to share our common advantage. Our reason tells us that since a person guided by reason seeks to enhance his own advantage, he will want to be in a group of like-minded people and help them become more capable since it enhances his advantage. Spinoza has hence demonstrated that an individual seeking his own advantage so as to preserve his being is the moral basis of ethics since it informs us about how to live with others which is to want for others what we want for ourselves, to make others better and in that way enhance their usefulness to us, which enhances our own advantage. It is human nature to desire what we consider to be good and shrink from what we consider bad. Since to be virtuous is to act in accordance with one's nature, the more a person seeks out what is good that is useful for him, the more virtuous he is. To be able to seek anything, first of all, requires existence, and thus to preserve one's existence is the foundational virtue. Prior to this drive to preserve our being, no virtue can be conceived. If we act on the basis of inadequate ideas, ideas which we do not sufficiently understand, we are not acting in obedience to virtue. We only act in obedience to virtue when we act according to the dictates of reason on the basis of seeking what is useful to one's self. To reason is to understand. The mind judges what is useful to it, meaning it seeks out things that are conducive to our understanding. What is good, therefore, is what is conducive to our understanding, and what is evil is what hinders us from understanding. Since God is an infinite being which encompasses everything, the mind's highest good is the knowledge of God and the mind's highest virtue is to know God, concludes Spinoza. Is Spinoza advocating we all study theology? In the preface of part 4, the phrase God or nature, Deus Siva Natura, occurs twice in the same paragraph. That eternal and infinite being we call God, or nature, acts from the same necessity from which he exists. For we have shown that the necessity of nature from which he acts is the same as that from which he exists. The reason, therefore, or cause, why God, or nature, acts, and the reason why he exists are one and the same. As he exists for the sake of no end, he also acts for the sake of no end. 
Spinoza had in part 1 already explained that there is no final cause, no final purpose, no teleology for all of existence. We are not headed towards some divine goal because there is no goal. It has all happened out of sheer necessity. The reason I bring this up here though is because if we reformulate Spinoza's point of what is our highest good with his Dea Siva Natura concept, it yields an interesting insight, especially for the non theists Since nature is an infinite being which encompasses everything, the mind's highest good is the knowledge of nature and the mind's highest virtue is to know nature. Our highest good is to gain knowledge of nature. Nature comprises all that exists, and the study of things that exist can be found in biology, the natural sciences including geography, but also arguably the humanities and the social sciences, since philosophy, sociology, anthropology, economics, history and even literature, to the extent that the subject of study concerns itself with the condition of humanity, the world and what exists. So we can even read Spinoza's statement to mean that our highest good is to gain knowledge of things that exist, though not fictional things. Returning to Spinoza's analysis of human psychology, only a thing that has something in common with our nature can do us harm or good, since a thing which nature is completely different from ours cannot affect us. However, what a thing has that is common with our nature cannot be evil, since it will be in line with our nature, which cannot be bad for us, since what is bad for us is what is contrary to our nature. Yet when people are subject to their passions, they may not agree with one another in their nature. They are torn by these passions, making them changeable and inconstant. To the extent that people are torn by their passions, they can be contrary to one another, but to the extent that they live according to reason, they agree in their nature. For a person pursuing virtue, what he desires for himself, he also desires for others. Since the highest good is the knowledge of God or nature, the more knowledge of God or nature a person has, the more he wants others to also have it. What causes people to live together in harmony is useful and what causes them to have discord is bad. This proposition bothered me because it seems to suggest that any disagreement is to be avoided. But reading it in the context of what else Spinoza had said, I do not think he is seeking some harmony that is oppressive and based on pretense, oppression or lies, but a harmony based on truth, that is, knowledge and reason. While joy is good and sadness is bad, Spinoza proposes that cheerfulness, while always good, should not be excessive. Melancholy, on the other hand, is always bad. Pleasure can be excessive, making it evil, because pleasure is a joy that affects some parts of our body more than others. This effect can be so great that it overwhelms the other actions of the body, preventing the body from experiencing other feelings, which reduces the capability of the body. Pain by itself is a sadness which is bad, but to the extent that it restrains pleasure, such that pleasure does not become excessive, it is good. Hate, however, is never good. Envy, derision, contempt, anger, revenge, and other emotions that come from hate are bad. What we want when we hate is dishonorable and can be unjust. Hence, Spinoza thinks that a person guided by reason will try to return love and kindness for other people's hatred and anger towards him. Since the emotion of hate is evil, one guided by reason will try to avoid being troubled by such an emotion. Because he wants for himself what he also wants for others, he will not want others to experience hate and hence will not return hate to them. Besides, love can defeat hate in the way a stronger emotion defeats a weaker emotion. Spinoza proposes that emotions of hope and fear are not in themselves good since they arise from sadness. There is no hope without fear, he writes. They can be good when they restrain excessive joy. Fear also is not necessarily contrary to reason. It can agree with reason and come from it. 
Overestimating oneself and scorn are also bad since they are contrary to reason, with overestimation possibly leading to pride. Great pride and great despondency indicates an ignorance of oneself and a weakness of mind, making one prey to one's emotions. The proud person revels in the company of flatterers and parasites and hates the company of the noble. Pity is also bad and useless for a person who is guided by reason because it is an emotion that brings sadness. Spinoza argues that whatever good that results from the emotion of pity comes from reason and not the emotion itself. Our reason which tells us to want good for others is enough to cause us to strive to free a person from his suffering and we do not need to be moved by our emotions to do that. Recall that Spinoza is a hard determinist for whom all things happen necessarily, including suffering. Nothing in itself is worthy of hate or pity. Instead, we should strive to enhance our virtue by acting well and being happy. We should help the needy out of reason and not raw emotions, since emotions are changeable. It should not depend on our mood to help a person in need. Similarly for other emotions, we should take action as a result of our reason and not let emotion be the driving force. Emotions causing sadness only decreases our ability to act since it reduces our power What emotions causing joy agrees anyway with reason. While overestimating oneself is bad, having a healthy self-esteem is good. A healthy self-esteem arises from reason and is a correct estimate of oneself. Love of esteem is not contrary to reason but can arise from it according to Spinoza. To strive to do well and hence have a high self-esteem is reasonable. Strictly speaking, humility is not a virtue because it is a sadness which arises from our consideration of our lack of power. Repentance is also not a virtue since one is twice wretched once from the suffering that comes from being conquered by evil desires and again from sadness. However, since people do not always follow reason, humility, repentance, hope and fear can be useful for controlling the masses. To the extent that our minds conceive things based on reason, it is equally affected by ideas of past, present or future. If we only knew how long things last, we will regard future occurrences as much as present ones, weighing future good as much as present ones. For instance, if we knew we were going to live another 20 years, then to care about a good that will occur in 10 years' time or the consequences of our present actions in 10 years is reasonable. However, because we have only an inadequate knowledge of the durations of things, including ourselves, we give more weight to present things since who knows if we would be alive in 10 years' time, in my example. Hence, our knowledge of good and bad can be easily overwhelmed by a desire for present pleasures. We should not be guided by fear and do good merely to avoid evil, since that makes the shunning of evil the direct act and the seeking of good indirect, which is not the way of reason. Instead, when led by reason, we should seek the good directly and shun evil indirectly. One knowledge of evil is an inadequate knowledge leading to sadness, which is a reduction of our power. If we only had adequate ideas, we would have no notion of evil, but then also no notion of good, since good and evil are relative concepts. Reason tells us that we should choose the greater of two goods or the lesser of two evils. For a greater future good, we should forsake a lesser present good. If a lesser present evil can help avoid a future greater evil, we should choose it. If a lesser present evil can cause a greater future good, we should choose it. If a lesser present good causes a greater future evil, we should shun it. Avoiding danger can be as virtuous as overcoming danger. A free person does not think much about death. His wisdom instead is a meditation on life. By free, Spinoza means a person who is led by reason alone. Such a person will avoid the favours of the ignorant, since the ignorant expects a payback or will be wrathful. 
Because only free people are useful to one another when joined in friendship and striving to benefit each other, only they are truly thankful to one another. Their gratitude is neither transactionary nor trapping. A free man always acts honestly, not deceptively, writes Spinoza. A person guided by reason lives more freely in a state with a system of laws than by himself because he lives with others who are useful to him and they help him preserve his being better. Part 5. Of the power of the intellect or on human freedom. Having explained why our passions bind us in part 4, Spinoza also has begun explaining how we can become free by using the power of our reason against our emotions. Despite Spinoza's hard determinism due to the ineluctable relation of cause and effect, he will show us what freedom means and how we can achieve it in this final part of the ethics. Before we enter into part 5 though, it is worth considering the various philosophical positions concerning free will and freedom. I have a more detailed but still short video on free will, please find the link in the description, but I will briefly cover the major positions here. Determinism is where every effect comes from a prior cause, which means that all that happens can be traced back to what has happened before and future events must inevitably take place in accordance to this causal chain. There is no other way that things could happen except how it has been determined from previous causes. For physical objects, their motion is determined by the motion of other objects affecting them. Even our thoughts are determined since previous thoughts will influence, indeed cause our subsequent thoughts. This will be familiar since determinism is Spinoza's position. The opposite position to determinism is libertarianism. Libertarians believe that we have free will. Regardless of what has happened before, we can still make free choices on what we want to do next. Proponents of free will may believe that this free will is due to our consciousness, a free agent within ourselves which can make choices, even choices that defy reason and the causal influence of external objects. Compatibilists are determinists who believe that despite everything being determined, we are still free since we choose freely what has been determined anyway. Say we are in a locked room but we are not aware the room is locked. We are happy to remain in that room, we choose to be in the room, making the fact that the room was locked moot. For the libertarian, free will is about having alternative choices which we really could take, while for the compatibilist, freedom is about not being obstructed in our will. The compatibilist freely choosing to remain in the locked room will not feel that his freedom had been obstructed. Is Spinoza a compatibilist? Not quite, though he does believe that we have freedom, though not free will. Being free for him is to use our reason to drive our actions instead of being driven by our passions, which are only partially caused by us. When we use our reason, we are the adequate cause of our actions. When we act according to these adequate causes, we act in accordance with our nature. Freedom for Spinoza is about acting according to what our reason tells us, free from the sway of our passions. In that way, God is free since he always acts in a perfect way, though he has no choice but to always choose the best path. A key question surrounding the debate on free will is moral responsibility. If our actions are determined and we had no choice in the matter, then how can we be held morally responsible? Should we be praised or rewarded for good acts and blamed or punished for bad ones? Spinoza has already explained in part 1 that the concepts of good and bad are human constructs. Things in themselves are neither good nor bad and whatever happens, happens necessarily. In Spinoza's system, rewards and punishment, praise and blame happen as a natural and necessary consequence of human actions, explained Christopher Klutz. A philosophy professor. Our nature compels us to preserve ourselves and our success is akin to reward while our failure is akin to punishment. Reward and punishment take place as natural and necessary consequences regardless whether or not there is moral responsibility. 
Klutz argues that the idea of responsibility is for Spinoza a social construct. In part 2, Spinoza proposed parallelism to explain the indirect connection between mind and body. The way thoughts and ideas are ordered and connected in the mind is the way effects and images of things are ordered and connected in the body. If we take away the emotions from our thoughts of an object and join these thoughts with other thoughts, the love, hate or uncertainty felt towards the object will dissipate. Think of this as emotional detachment and putting things in perspective. An emotion that is a passion stops being a passion once we form a clear and distinct idea of it and its cause, giving us more control over it. The mind becomes less passive the more we understand things. There is no emotion or condition resulting from the emotion in our bodies that we cannot form a clear and distinct concept of. Our desires are passions when they come from inadequate ideas, but become virtues when they come from adequate ideas. If we can understand that all things happen necessarily, we have a greater power over our emotions and are less acted upon by them. As long as we do not allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by emotions contrary to our nature, we are able to order them according to the order of our intellect. The more an image is related to other things, the more frequently it appears and hence the more it engages the mind. The mind is able to link emotions and images to the idea of God or nature. Hence the better a person understands himself and his emotions, the more he loves God or nature. Spinoza believes that this love towards God or nature must engage the mind most. God or nature, however, has no passions, is not affected by joy or sadness and so hates and loves no one. Because our idea of God or nature is adequate, it is associated with joy without sadness and so no one can hate God or nature. Because the love of God or nature is the greatest good which our reason tells us that we should want, it should not be tainted by envy or jealousy since we want more people to love God or nature. The mind has the ability to control its emotions through its knowledge of the emotions. It can separate the emotion from its thoughts of the causes of the emotion. By relating the causes of the emotions to God or nature, the force of the emotion is reduced. The mind can only think while the body is alive. However, God has an idea of us which expresses our essence eternally. Hence our mind is not totally destroyed by our bodies when we die but some aspect of it remains, which is the eternal aspect of it. The more we understand things, the more we understand God or nature. In part 4, Spinoza said that the highest task of the mind which makes it the highest virtue is to understand God or nature. Spinoza elaborates it here. We should seek to understand things through the third kind of knowledge, which is intuitive knowledge beginning from adequate ideas of the essence of God or nature's attributes which leads us to adequate knowledge of the essence of things. The more we are able to understand things by the third kind of knowledge, the more we desire to do so. We gain great satisfaction from doing this because it makes us more perfect since we understand ourselves and virtue better, which then gives us joy. Since the desire to know things through the third kind of knowledge comes not from the first kind of knowledge, which is opinion, but can arise from the second kind, which is reasoning from common notions and adequate ideas. When the mind understands under the form of eternity, it does not do so through the body which is not eternal, but through the essence of the body, according to Spinoza. It is part of the nature of reason to conceive things under such a form of eternity. What I understand by the form of eternity is abstraction and universalization. When we try to understand things, we abstract, universalizing the specific so as to understand it generally. Knowledge of our minds and bodies under this form of eternity is a knowledge of God or nature since the mind and body are in God or nature and are conceived through God or nature. The third kind of knowledge is caused by the mind to the extent that the mind is eternal. What we can understand through this third kind of knowledge we take pleasure in 
with this pleasure accompanied by the idea of God or nature as the cause of this joy. From this then arises in us an intellectual love of God, which is an eternal love. Such an intellectual love of God or nature is the same love in which God loves himself, to the extent that God can be explained by the mind's essence. God loves himself with an infinite intellectual love, writes Spinoza. The more we understand things through the second and third kinds of knowledge, the less we will be subject to bad emotions and we will be less fearful of death. A person whose body is capable of more activities has a mind where more of it is eternal. The more active we are, that is, the more we use our reason to drive our acts, the more perfect we are and the more of our minds are eternal. The part of the mind that remains after the death of our body is more perfect than the rest which dies with the body. However, even if we are not aware of the eternal aspects of the mind, morality, religion and things related to tenacity and nobility are of prime importance. To be blessed is not a reward of being virtuous, but is virtue itself. We rejoice not because we can control our lusts, but because we rejoice, we can control our lusts. My way of thinking about that line is that we are good not because we can control our desires, but because we are good, we can hence control our desires. Because of our imminent goodness, we are able to overcome sadness and suffering and become happy. To be virtuous is its own blessing and reward. This view of Spinoza's can be considered stoical in the sense that we cannot control external occurrences, but we can control our responses. And so long as we do the virtuous thing, we can be satisfied with ourselves, regardless of what the actual outcomes are, for instance, a lack of recognition or reward for our virtuous acts. The final lines of a book are often interesting, and the ethics is not an exception. All things excellent are as difficult as they are rare, writes Spinoza. He recognizes that he has provided a difficult doctrine which in contrast with the Judeo-Christian understanding of God as an almighty, controlling and judging deity, remains hard to swallow. Perhaps this is why he adopted the geometric deductive method, to put his findings beyond reproach since it is based on a rigorous logic and clear premises. He continually demands we apply our reason to try to understand as clearly and distinctly ideas so that we can proceed with confidence and not be driven hither and thither by hearsay and emotions. He promises no less than salvation in the ethics by fostering an intellectual love of God, but a God which is not transcendent and watching from above, but is simply all that there is, that is, nature. While the use of the geometric method demonstrates his desire for rigor, it would be a mistake to think that what he has done is akin to mathematical proof that what he has said is irrefutable. How solid his deductions are depends on whether one accepts his definitions and axioms. They have not been argued for, instead relying on a kind of intuition or self-evident nature for its truth, which might not be the case. For instance, the very first definition he provides on how what is self-caused must exist may seem self-evident, but it assumes that there are indeed things that are self-caused which would then seem to require that they exist necessarily, for where could they possibly have come from except that they have always existed? One can as easily put forward a definition or axiom that says that everything must have had a beginning which would then be used to contradict the concept of the self-caused. Such a definition or axiom may seem likewise intuitive or self-evident, likewise difficult to prove, and hence has to be accepted as fundamental. Thus, I think that while his effort at rigor is admirable, it should not be mistaken for proven and hence the truth, though that may be Spinoza's aim, to argue for his theory as tightly as is humanly possible. He did not begin writing this book from a position of epistemic innocence, but already had a theory in mind, which he then chose to argue for using the geometric method. Nonetheless, an outcome of his rigor is that he has developed a coherent system. However, his theory remains a theory, still dwelling in the inevitable speculating morass of metaphysics, 
no matter how prettily it is dressed up in geometric deductive form. Metaphysics remains beyond the realm of human experience, and while we can attempt bravely, like the Enlightenment thinkers such as Descartes and Spinoza, to ground it in logic and reason, the Kantian argument can still be levelled against it. That what our reasoning reveals is how our reasoning works, how our thought processes work and not necessarily the nature of reality. In conclusion, Spinoza presents us with a coherent and more importantly a fascinating theory which challenges our ideas on the nature of reality, on God, free will and human motivation. His key lessons of how we can overcome our passions through reason, of making our minds and bodies more capable by striving to improve our understanding of nature and to have an intellectual love of nature, remain attractive, while his ideas of a deistic God equivalent to nature and the lack of free will still remain controversial today as it did in the 17th century. Thank you.